We are in the book of Revelation, chapter 10. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand, we'll get you one. If not, open up to chapter 10. We're going to start with verse 1. But before we do, we're going to notice that in Revelation, there's this pattern that, that God has put into this book. Because if you remember after the opening of the six scrolls in chapter 6, John was shown other events in heaven. Right before the opening of that seventh seal, there was a pause. These four angels were holding the four winds, and they were being told not to harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until the servant of God were sealed. And if you remember, those servants were 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, most likely prophets or evangelists, because in Zechariah 12.10, we are reminded, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him, as one weeps over a firstborn. And then we saw in verse 9 of chapter 7 that we were shown a great multitude which no one could number. All of the nation, tribes, peoples, and tongues were present, standing before the throne and the Lamb of God. The ones that came out of the tribulation period and the followers of Christ were in heaven and God would wipe away every tear from their eyes. God's mercy, even in the time of judgment, for he desires that none should perish. But even in that time, he's doing a work in the hearts of men. And that seventh and final seal was broken and the Lord could have ended it all there. But instead, we read that there were seven trumpets now after that seventh seal was opened. The Lord could have ended it, and what was left of humanity, Satan and his adversaries could have been brought to justice, to their final fate. But the seal started, the seven trumpets, the judgments that we just went through, and here we are, we just finished talking about the last and sixth, well, the sixth trumpet, and right before the seventh trumpet is blown, now we have this pause that we're going to be reading through. Chapter 10, verse 1. I saw still another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with the cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. So we begin here with John seeing this angel, and he calls him another mighty angel, meaning another of the same kind. That is an angel similar to other angels which we have been previously introduced like, for example, the angel in chapter 5, verse 2. He is the one that says with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and lose its seals? Or even the angel that we read about in chapter 8, verse 2, with the golden censer. Now, some expositors of Revelation, they believe that the angel mentioned here, as well as the angel with the golden censer, is none other than Jesus Christ. Because when you look at the angel with the golden censer who offered incense mixed with prayer before the golden altar in the temple of heaven, then obviously this must be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. But in verse 1, we can see definitely that there are certain attributes of these angels that are likened unto Jesus in Revelation. Let's do a quick comparison. This angel comes down from heaven. And there is no evidence, however, that Christ comes to earth midway in the tribulation. We know that when he does come down to step foot on the Mount of Olives, that's when it all ends. This angel is clothed with a cloud, but Jesus comes with clouds. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. The angel has a rainbow on his head, 
But the rainbow mentioned in Revelation is around the throne of God. Revelation chapter 4, verse 3. The angel's face was like the sun. Now the splendor of Jesus in Revelation 1.16, we read how his countenance is like the sun, shining in its strength. And this is probably the closest verse that comes to one of the attributes of this angel. Now the angel has feet like pillars of fire. In Revelation 1.15, we read that Jesus' feet were like fine brass, as refined by fire, but not on fire. In verse 2, he had a little book that was open. But that word that is used there is not the word for scroll. It is not a scroll. It is a book. So it is not the seven sealed scroll that is now open, and some might say, notice that his right foot is on the sea and not in it. Who walked on water? Jesus did. So there are a lot of good similarities there, but there's really nothing that actually solidifies the fact that this angel is Jesus Christ. Even with the angel with the golden censer, okay, he was allowed to perform a duty that was reserved only for the high priest in the temple or in the tabernacle. Only the high priest was allowed to offer the prayers of the saints, the incense on the altar of incense. But, that doesn't mean that, and, and we know that Hebrew says that Jesus is our once and forever high priest now in heaven. But that does not mean that the Lord could not have chosen these angels, which are ministering spirits, for specific functions, such as doing this. But there is a difference here as opposed to what was done in the temple, because these prayers are touched with the fire of the altar, and they are cast down in earth. As in response to the cries of his people, who throughout the years have asked for them to be avenged for the injustices that have happened in this world. Just as we read earlier in Revelation, where they say, Lord, how much longer, how much longer will you hold back? But we know that God has a perfect timing. And so we got this impression that the prayers of the saints are so important for the tribulation. And I remember that I encourage you, you know, pray for people, because who knows if the time draws near how God's going to use that prayer during the time of Revelation. But the idea of Jesus likened as an angel is found in the Scriptures in several places, but most likely where? In the Old Testament passages. He is described as the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord appeared to Abraham. The angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar. The angel of the Lord appeared in different places. This title was reserved for a future revealing of Jesus Christ of the pre-existence of Jesus. In other words, that he wasn't born or created, but he existed before he came in the form of a man. However, when we look at this, we know that Jesus is not an angel, because Hebrews talks about it. They address that in that book, because there was a belief that maybe he was, and there are still religions in this world that believe that he is an angel. But when we look at what we can describe him as an angel, well, maybe if we look at it in the sense of a messenger, because an angel is a word for messenger, then that is true about Jesus, that he is a messenger. Matter of fact, in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 49, he says, I do not speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. So even though he was the Word made flesh, he was under the authority of the Father in everything that he spoke. And as far as the New Testament and in the book of Revelation, angels are always angels. Jesus is never referred to as an angel in the New Testament. So this angel is called another mighty angel. And it's most likely in reference to the angel in chapter 5, who was also a strong angel and clearly not Jesus. It is an angel who is given power and authority. And that's represented by the fact that his foot is standing on the land and on the sea. It's a symbol of his authority that he was given by God. And as I mentioned in a previous study, there are many instances in Revelation where angels are made the ministers of God for both the punishment of the wicked and the protection of the righteous. Just as we know that the archangel Michael is the protector of Israel. We know that from the book of Daniel. 
And this angel, he holds a little book. It's open. And what is written in the open book is not revealed in the book of Revelation. It is a summary of the events that took place. We don't know. We don't know what it is because it's really not told to us. And I know that maybe bothers some of us. I know it bothers me because I want to know a lot of things. (laughs) But I also need to remember that the Lord does not reveal it for a purpose. And what is safe to say that it seems to represent the written authority given to the angel to fulfill whatever mission God has for him. And John beholds this vision with the angel standing upon the sea and the earth. And the angel cries with a loud voice like a lion's roar. Another reason they say, see, this is Jesus. He is the lion of Judah. But it just says like a lion's roar. Not that he roared like a lion. In answer to the cry of the angel, seven thunders are heard. Now the seven thunders are interesting. So again, how do we interpret scripture? We look to scripture. And one of the things that we can reference to as far as these thunders are in Psalm 29, verses 3 to 9, where it describes the thunderous voice of the Lord by the psalmist, and where seven times it repeats the phrase, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord. If you want to read it, I would read it, but for time's sake, we're not going to do that, but you can go home and look at those seven sayings. But seven, again, being the number that is repeated throughout this book because it is the perfect completion of the Lord, that number seven. That means that whatever was uttered was perfect to complete what it was purposed to utter for. Did that make sense? All right, just making sure you're awake. So it is perfect in what it will accomplish. So these seven thunders that uttered their voices are most likely further revelations. And it was speaking in a voice that John was able to understand. How do we know that? Because it says in that verse that he was told not to write it down. And that is why we do not know what they said. So why tell us that there were things written that we can't know? I don't know. He's God. <laughs> Right? And and I'm okay with that, you know, because maybe one day we will know. And and as I've said in previous studies, perhaps many of the things that we don't know are really meant for those that are going to be going through the tribulation. And so it also humbles us in saying that we don't know all things in Revelation, nor can we say that we know everything regarding end times. We know what we know, but there's some things we don't know. So I like to focus on what is plain and what God does make us know so that we may understand those things and teach them and apply them in our lives. For example, in verse 5, the angel was standing on the sea and on the land. Now the Bible doesn't specify what land or what sea. When we went through the first three trumpet judges, remember, one-third of the trees, the grass, and the land was burned. One third of the sea was turned to blood. One third of the creatures died. One third of the ships were destroyed. One third of the rivers and the springs were made bitter. But we don't know where that took place geographically. Was it in Israel? Was it the Mediterranean Sea? You know, if we look at Revelation 13, which we will eventually get to, we don't know which third of the earth was affected. Or we can just look at this as a general reference to the whole earth. Because the Lord is bringing his judgment upon the whole earth. So we can speculate if that land is Israel. We can speculate if that sea is the Mediterranean Sea based on later chapters. But then it would just be speculation. Which is dangerous because speculation can turn into doctrine. And then doctrine can be used as a foundation for other doctrine that is not on, as we were singing, solid rock, but on sinking sand. So it's important for us to just say, it's okay to say, I don't know. If somebody asks you, what, what, what? I don't know, but God does. But let me tell you what I do know and what's important because the Lord doesn't always tell us what we want, but he certainly tells us what we need. And that's what we need to focus on. So unless we can find something in the scriptures where that symbolism was first used, 
it still doesn't mean that it's going to validate how it's being used here, but most likely it is something that we could look back on and say, okay, I can see how it applies here. But if it doesn't, it's better not to speculate. And by the way, if anything that you speculate on contradicts Scripture, then you know that it's not good. It won't apply because the Lord will never contradict His Word. So while God has revealed much, there are secrets which God has not seen fit to reveal to men at this time for only the reasons that he keeps. And he brings me back to Isaiah 55a, right? You know it? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, right? What else? Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we will pay attention to the things that he does want us to know instead of building doctrine on things that he doesn't reveal. Like I said, I can look at different commentaries and, and, and tell you the differences out there, but what, what's the point in that? So let's study what we do know. So looking further into verse five, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servant the prophets. So the mighty angel, he gave a solemn oath, declaring that the end is set in motion that there should be no delay, no longer. There was absolutely no turning back at this point. God has always been merciful in his judgment, patient, long-suffering, but the time has come where his patience are righteously determined not to go further. And so the angel swears by the Lord, for he is the one who lives forever and ever. And he is the one who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that are in it. Now, when someone swears, like, for example, if you've ever been to court and you're picked to be on the jury or to be a witness, they usually bring you a Bible. They tell you to put your hand, your right hand in the Bible and swear by God, right? Because he is greater. But here, and and, and by the way, a good example of that which I'm going to talk about here is that God cannot swear by anyone else, but who by himself, because there's nobody greater than him. Have we ever seen that in the Bible? Absolutely. In the book of Genesis, if you remember the story of Abraham, where he has to go and the Lord tells him to sacrifice his son, Isaac on Mount Moriah in Genesis chapter 22, verse 16, the Lord makes an oath there to Abraham. He makes it in his name. And it's an oath to bless Abraham and his descendants forever. Because it says, where he blessed Abraham and his future descendants, and he said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and you have not withheld your son, your only son. So the Lord, even with some of the covenants he made with man, he did it in his name because he wasn't going to depend on man to not do their part. And so even he did that with Abraham with the division of the animals, the blood covenant, and he caused them to go into a deep sleep, and the Lord walked through that blood by himself, saying to Abraham, I'm not going to depend on you to do your part. I'm going to do this. Because there is no one greater than him. The Lord swore his word in his name. So if this angel were Jesus, would he have not sworn by his own name? I would think so. Because there is no one greater. And he and the Father the same. When we hear the oath, though, God the sovereign ruler has given this angel the authority to declare, to remind all men that he is the creator of all things. And I think that is so important, especially when we look at our world. And last week we were talking about how we are leaning more and more towards the worship of earth. And it's just like Romans says, for they worship the creation and not the creator. And so here's this angel. We don't know if what he says is being heard throughout the world, but we do know this, that it is so important 
for God to remind mankind that he is the one who created, that we are not a byproduct of circumstances or chance. He created us. He made us. And despite the tru- the, these trumpet judgments which were cast upon the earth in chapter 9, the last verse reads, And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual morality or their thefts. We know from those trumpet judgments, we see God's mercy because, you know, one-third of mankind. First it was one-fourth, now it's one-third. It works out to be 50% of the population. And yet with all that the Lord did, men would still not repent. And now he says that there will be no further delay. Now as scary as it may sound, (laughs) we know what the end is. And it is far from scary. It is glorious what God has for us. There will be no more death. There will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more separation from God. There will be no more curse. And so on and so on for those who are in Christ. And the angel declares that that day of the sounding of that seventh angel, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, in the Bible, a mystery is a mystery. It isn't something that no one knows. A mystery is something that no one could know unless it was revealed to him. Throughout the scripture, we see many usages of this phrase regarding God's plan. For example, in Ephesians 3, God's purpose for the church is called a mystery. In Romans 11.25, we see the ultimate conversion of the Jewish people is called a mystery. And the bringing in the fullness of the Gentiles is also called a mystery. In Colossians 4, the gospel itself is called the mystery of Christ. And in Colossians 1, the living princes of Jesus and the believer is called the mystery of God. In this context, the mystery of God probably refers to the unfolding of the Old Testament. Passages which he spoke through his prophets, Isaiah, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, and so forth how he talked about a fulfillment of Jesus in the New Testament regards the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth and his resolution of all things, the finishing of his plan of the ages. At the end of all this, we will see changes. We will see a kingdom being established. We're going to see righteous ruling. There will be other things that will happen as well, but eventually there will be a new earth and a new heaven and a new Jerusalem in which the bride of Christ stays, there will be the white throne judgment with everyone who has rebelled against God will be placed into the lake of fire for eternity. How much more important for us to share the gospel. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again. We're going to continue reading there. What verse is that? Hey, thank you. I think I would know. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go. Take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And I was reading more about this angel, and it took me back to our study of Daniel. Because there were certain things that triggered my memory there. If you remember when we were studying Daniel in chapter 10 at the great river Tigris, Daniel was fasting and praying. Is it just me, but when you hear that word, do you think of Tigger from Winnie the Pooh? (laughs) Daniel was fasting and praying. He was interceding for his people and the angel Gabriel to give him understanding of the end time events as he was praying about the 70 weeks, the 490 years where he was told that there would be a time of the Messiah, and then the seventh or the final seven years is what is being taught to us here in Revelation. And so he's praying and fasting, and an angel comes to him. Well, it's interesting because we think it's an angel, but it says that it was a man that was clothed in linen. And when you look at the description of this man, there are similarities to this angel in chapter 10. Not much, but a few. For example, this angel stood on top of the waters of the river. He didn't have one foot on the land and one foot on the sea, but he had both feet walking on the water, I guess, or standing on the water. 
He held up his right and left hand to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever, just as this angel did, that it shall be for a time, time, and times and a half, a time. So he's talking about that three and a half year period in Revelation, which is what we're about to embark upon here. This, from this point on, it's going to relate to that other part of the tribulation period. And when the power of the holy people had been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. This is what it said in Daniel, which is kind of like what we're hearing here. And then he said to Daniel, go your way, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And here we read about the same three and a half year time period of Revelation. And John is told not to reveal the things which were uttered. But that doesn't mean that this angel is the same angel as that one. But it's just interesting that it all seems to relate in one way, shape, or form. God bless you. Now, when I read here about this book that John is told to eat, this section reminds me of a reading in the book of Ezekiel. If you remember the story of the prophet, he was told to eat a scroll. It wasn't just him. It wasn't a book. It was a scroll. It was the revelation of God to Israel at the time, and not just Ezekiel, but Jeremiah were were told to do the same thing. And they both said that it was sweet, but they mentioned nothing about it being bitter. Now, it was most likely not a physical eating of the scroll. I don't think God would make us want to eat a scroll unless it was made of some kind of edible paper. But most likely in the vision, they ate it and... It manifested itself in the physical, like when you think about biting a lemon, you start to salivate of the sourness, right? I can see some people go, oh. So in this vision, it was so realistic that it affected them and, and they were able to say it was sweet. Why did the Lord ask the prophets to eat these words, just as he asked John? Because the eating of the scroll is symbolic of a spiritual truth. These prophets must not just speak the words as the Holy Spirit directed them to, but they must receive it within themselves. It's just like us. You know, I was thinking about this, and I went back to my grammar school days. When our body begins to eat through the introduction of food into our mouth, before that food even gets to our mouth, already our saliva glands start to produce saliva. So that when you chew your food and you break it down into pieces that are more easy to digest, the saliva mixes with the food to break it down into something that our body can absorb. And then the esophagus brings that food into a container called the stomach. It also prevents that food from leaving the stomach and working its way back, or if not, you get ajana or, you know, (laughs) heartburn. It just reminds me of a quick story. I, was, I used to watch TV upside down, like with my head watching TV. We only had one TV in the house. And one day I'm eating something and my mother walks in and she goes, oh, my God, my mom was such a warrior. You're going to choke. And I said, Mom, do you know that your esophagus has these rings that actually push the food and you can eat upside down? You're going to choke. <laughs> Sometimes a little knowledge is not good. But the saliva mixes with the food to break it down to the form that your body can absorb, and then it goes to the stomach. Then the stomach further breaks it down into another form in which your body can absorb it, and it becomes part of your body, and we know that it's beneficial to your body. My point is this. I'm not going to go through the intestines and everything else that goes, but my point is that we digest the Word of God to benefit us before we could be a messenger of that Word to others. In other words, we apply it to ourselves so that we then can also be filled and have something to offer to others, right? We cannot be empty vessels. That's why getting in the Word and spending time with the Lord is important, because if we start our day with that, then we can go forward in that day filled with whatever God has given us, so that we may have something to offer. If not, we are just repeating knowledge, and that's not what the word is about. And, and even though you may quote the Bible, we know that it's active and powerful and living. So even if you just quote it, it's going to do its job. But when it's personal to us, the impact is so much better, right? Because you're more passionate, you're more confident in the word of God, and it's just more powerful when it comes out 
after you had a chance to apply it in your life. Just like Ezekiel and Jeremiah had to take that scroll and eat it, John had to ask the angel for the book. The Lord does not force his word upon us, but asks us to take it and to meditate on it and to receive it willingly. He does not force us to read it every morning or late at night or whatever you take the time out to do your devotionals with him. But he reminds us and encourages us to do that because he knows the benefits of the word, just as we know the benefit of eating food is to our bodies. Joshua 1 a says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. John was told to go and take the book, which is open in the hands of the angel. And the angel gives the little book to John and he tells him this. He says, take and eat it. It will make your mouth, it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Verse 10. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. It was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. When John ate the book, it was exactly as he was told it would be. It would be sweet in his mouth, but bitter in his stomach. Unlike the prophets of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, where the words were sweet, John's book was a little bitter as well. I imagine that it has something to do with the context in which this book is given to him, and the time in which it is given to him. It's a time of tribulation. It's a time of trouble. It's a time of God's judgments upon the world, a time where his wrath will come upon the world, which is bitter. But it is needed to bring mankind to a place where they can call upon the mercy of God. And so it could be bitter, but it's also sweet because we see the Lord's mercy in it. And just like the prophets, the words consumed by them were spoken to those whom the Lord reserved them for. And the content of this book was connected to John's command to do what? To prophesy to all men, not just to the believers, but to many people, nations, tongues, and kings. So important. When I was reading through this chapter, I was reminded of my first missions trip. Now, I was never a person who liked to travel much. And my job, they used to send me all over to, to work with different customers. And I never liked being away from the family. And one time when I was laid off of my career of many years, uh, I worked for an electrician who said, you want to go on a missions trip? I'm like, never really thought about it, but okay. So we prayed about it. And he said, I'm going to shut down the business. I can't pay you, but I'm going to pay for you to go. Sounds good to me. <laughs> I'm not worried. God will provide. So I go on this trip. And I want to tell you that there were a lot of challenges. <laughs> I know that's probably not what you want to hear. You probably want to hear some cool stories. And there are a lot of cool stories. But for me, this was my first missions trip. And I remember when I was on the plane, I was very discouraged on the way back because it was nothing that I thought it was going to be. The leadership was lacking, not because they weren't good leaders, but because on this trip, the plans that we that were made did not go the way they were planned. And there were a lot of challenges. The team was working in extreme conditions, and the flesh came out a lot. And, you know, there were things that weren't handled the way they should have been. I'm not being critical. What I'm saying is just truth. But I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, I will never go on another missions trip if it was up to me. Because I know that if it's up to him, I have to be obedient. But the Lord reminded me on the flight back, when, when we go on these missions trips, yes, it's good to, to bless people with things and give them things. He goes, but if you don't talk about the gospel, if you don't give them eternity, what's the point? Shoes wear out, clothes wear out, food eventually uh, depletes, but what he has to offer is eternal. And, But at the same time, 
he reminded me that that's really what it's all about. Don't, don't misunderstand what a missions trip is all about because sometimes we think it's because we're going to go out there and bless people with things. And, and we have that mentality where we go to a country that's very poor and we go, oh, oh my God, they need this and they need that. And, but if you don't give them Jesus, then you're forgetting the most important thing that they need. Because the Word of God will transform any culture to think differently. Don't do what your ancestors did. Don't do what you were traditionally taught to do. Do what the Word of God does and what it tells you to do. So I thought about that and I realized <laughs> that the, you, the Lord used it in my life not to discourage me, but to teach me some valuable lessons. Because unbeknownst to me, God was going to call me to lead many missions trips. And if he would have revealed that to me back then, I probably would have jumped on the first boat to Tarshish, right? Don't worry, Mary, I would have took you and the kids with us. <laughs> because I would never would have thought that he was going to use me on the next trip to lead. I just came off a trip. I'm not ready to lead, but God knew. And here I am leading a team of 10 people. And I got to tell you, it was tough because two of them didn't get along very well. <laughs> I should have worn my uh, referee suit back then. But but that's okay, you know, because everything that God used in my life was to teach me and prepare me for what he was calling me to do. And that's important. And I learned on that on that trip, Proverbs 69. Do you know what verse that is? Come on. You guys know. Watch, I'll start saying, A man hearts plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. We should always be prayerful, of course, of everything we do for the Lord, especially with a trip where we're going outside of our comfort zone and people are going to be stretched and we're going to go into the unknown where we may not speak the language, but we're going to serve the Lord and the people that we're going to visit. I would prepare an agenda on all the missions trips we would go on and I would sit with the teams and I would meet with them several times before we go out because I think it's very important for them to understand. And we would go through the, this is what we're planning, right? And I take out my paper. I give out a copy to everybody, pray about all these things. We're going to be building a building for this family. We are going to be going to the nursing home. We're going to be going to this place. We're going to be doing this, 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 this. And I go through everybody. Any questions? No? Good. Okay. And then I would take that paper and I would go like this. This is our agenda. What are you talking about? I said, because God may have other plans. Now, we're praying and we believe that this is what God wants us to do. But we need to be flexible. Because when you're out there, you don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how many times God changed the plan for us. And I got to tell you, every time it was a blessing in disguise. Because we didn't know what God had for us. It's okay. He goes, okay, you, you think you're going to do that? That's fine. That's okay. I heard your prayers. No problem. But... Things are going to change when you get out there. You're going to do it my way. That's right. <laughs> and I got to tell you, it was sweet whenever it was God's way. You know, just like when I went to Haiti, I really believed that I was going to go to, the, to that hospital and minister to people that had amputations. You know, my heart broke and I wanted to go. And But... <sighs> God had other plans, and we ended up going somewhere else. The team split into three different groups, and God had a plan for every group. Now, that was a different trip. It wasn't a trip that I was leading. It was a trip where a few of us just decided, let's just go. And the Lord had me on a different type of trip where I was making connections with people, and now those connections were going to be used for ministry in the future for teams that were going to come from other countries and from other states to, to, to minister there in Haiti. And I got to be a part of that. It was different for me. But what's good is that, you know, when you look at all this, if you're like me, you probably want to know all the answers in the book of Revelation or any other book. Remember, I'm the kid who got in trouble for asking too many questions. And I got the, I got the, I got the report cards at home to prove it. <laughs> but I can find that I'm reminded that I should not focus or even speculate on what is spoken, but instead on what is 
plainly written there in the scriptures. It's like the Lord was showing me personally that it is good to dig in and search the scriptures. But what about the things that you've already learned? Have you committed to those? We want to know new information, but what about the stuff we already know? Are we applying that in our lives? Are we putting feet to it? Because if we're just trying to gain knowledge, but we're not, we're not taking what we've already been given, those revelations that come from the Holy Spirit when you're reading and spending time in the Word, and you're not applying it to your life, well then, what good is it to learn more about the Word of God? And and that's what, I, I when I read this, I go, you know, Lord, how come? Because it's frustrating. Lord, I want to be able to teach this. I want people to understand. All, and, and it's like, whoa, whoa, relax. <laughs> what is there is important. What's not there is not. It's good to know it, but it doesn't mean that you're going to understand it. And it's just like this example that we see here from John. One thing we could walk away with today regarding this little book is how the Lord has a word for all of us that is personal and he wants us to receive it just like John. See, the Lord tells us to go get that book, right? And I'm talking about this book. Go get that book from the hand of the angel, okay? So the Lord tells us to read. He wants us to read. And then he wants us to ask. And what does that mean? Pray. Lord, okay, I opened it up. What is it that you want me to learn today? What are you speaking to me personally about? Or is it just me knowing the word so that I can quote scripture, but I don't apply it into my life? Because God does have application for us. And then we have to take it. We actually have to open this book to to read it. And then we have to eat it. We have to read it. We have to meditate on it. We have to chew it and say, okay, Lord, how does this apply to me? See, the word will be sweet. It always is because it's God's word and it refreshes our soul and it encourages us. It's the words of eternal life. Just like when Jesus was asked, of his, Lord, where else will we go to? Only you alone have the words of eternal life. What a great answer. But as we digest it, it may be bitter. Because there may be conviction there of things that we need to change in our life. But that bitterness will pass away. But do we forget those things that we're convicted of? That's important. Do not forget. Because the Lord wants you to apply it in your life. It's important. And not only that, as we apply it to our lives, God's going to use it. What's that verse that says in in Corinthians? I will comfort with the, uh, you will comfort others with the same comfort that I give you. A lot of times we go through things so that we can comfort others through similar situations, that we can encourage others. I've been there. I know the Lord has shown me that. Then we are done. No, sir. We must remember what the Lord has given you so that you may share it, just as John was told that he is going to continue to do this, to reach out to those, as it says there, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Whatever it is that the Lord gives you that word for, whoever it is, should be for you and then for others as the Lord leads and as the Spirit leads. Amen. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for these reminders of how important it is for us to sit at your feet. Lord, to take the things that we know that are plainly written in scriptures and to understand it. Not just know it, but to understand it, which means that we have to digest it. That means that we have to meditate on it. That means we have to apply it to our lives. We can't just be hearers of the word. We need to be doers of the word. And Father, we thank you that you give us your word because you love us so much. You don't just want us to know about you. You also want us to know about ourselves and what we need to change. Lord, so that we may be more like you. Amen.